Good afternoon. We have topical questions. Question number one, Alice McInnes. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit is to be abolished. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government has not been advised of any plans to abolish Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit. Alice McInnes. The future of the counter-corruption unit matters to Parliament because its activities have been of national significance. And MSPs have spent months scrutinising its unlawful spying on journalist sources. Um, Scottish ministers were happy to cut the red tape and open the unit in 2013 as a vital service. Um, I asked the Justice Secretary last September whether the government was concerned about the conduct of the, the counter-corruption unit at all. He dodged the question then, so I ask it again now. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any concerns about the conduct of Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member will be aware that the Scottish Police Authority have requested the uh, HMICS to undertake a review um, of the counter-corruption unit following the IOCO investigation um, at last year, and that review is presently taking place. And it would seem that the most sensible thing for us all to do is to wait for the outcome of that review that HMICS is presently undertaking. And I've got no doubt that at that point, both the Scottish Police Authority and the Chief Constable uh, will want to consider uh, any further measures that they believe is necessary in relation to the counter-corruption unit. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. It's been reported in the media that the counter-corruption unit's powers would be handed to PERC, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner. If this is the case, the Cabinet Secretary would have to get involved because the Commissioner's powers are set in statute. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell Parliament whether the Government has had any discussions with either Police Scotland or PERC about such a legislative change? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think it's always uh, dangerous for any member to come to this chamber and to base their question uh, on the basis of what's contained within a, a newspaper report, uh, uh, which I'm sure all politicians are well aware, aware of are not always necessarily uh, as accurate uh, as some members may believe they are. And as I've already mentioned, uh, we have not been made aware of any uh, planned changes to the counter-corruption unit. Uh, and again, I would reiterate the point, the most sensible thing for us all to do is to allow HMICS to undertake the review once they have reported to the SPA. I've got no doubt they want to consider its findings alongside that of the Chief Constable's view on any actions that should be taken in moving forward. Lee Murray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, the uh, Scottish Police Federation and retired officers have raised a number of concerns, some of those with the Justice Committee, about the culture and work practices adopted by the counter-corruption unit, including disproportionate investigation into their private lives, the use of detention of up to seven hours, and escorting them to washroom facilities during breaks in their interviews. So uh, will the Cabinet Secretary engage with the SPA to ensure that human rights and natural justice are concepts to be extended to those who would investigate allegations against police officers to ensure proper proportionality? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am aware of the evidence that was provided to, uh, to the Justice Committee, and I'm also aware that the uh, Commissioner uh, for PERC uh, also requested specific evidence of uh, these matters. And it's my understanding to date there has been no evidence being provided to the PERC uh, on these particular instances. Um, so I think if there are uh, uh, allegations being made about how the counter-corruption unit has operated or uh, even how PERC has operated, then it's important that uh, evidence is submitted so that these issues can be uh, considered. But I'm sure the member would also recognise that there is a uh, an issue here where uh, members have often uh, stated that uh, uh, the, uh, the Scottish Police Authority uh, don't uh, get ahead of themselves and get involved in matters that need to be reformed within Police Scotland or to address issues of concern which have been raised in Police Scotland uh, in the past. And here we have the Scottish Police Authority uh, doing exactly what I think they should be doing, and that is asking HMICS to go in and carry out a review of the counter-corruption unit. Uh, and once they've actually uh, completed that review, it would seem the most appropriate and sensible thing to do is to wait for that report to be completed and then for the Scottish Police Authority to consider that along with Police Scotland and any further measures that are taken. And I think that demonstrates the governance process uh, within the new structures of a single police force here in Scotland uh, operating in a way that it should, where the Scottish Police Authority should be looking into these matters and that work is already ongoing at the present moment. I've got no doubt they'll consider HMICS's report uh, in due course once it's been submitted. Margaret Mitchell. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The whole issue surrounding transparency and accountability in the Counter Corruption Unit has raised questions about how easy it is for police officers with legitimate concerns to report these in confidence. The public generally recognises this activity as whistleblowing. Here, the person making the disclosure to be covered by the definition of whistleblowing must believe two things. One, they are acting in the public interest, and two, they must reasonably believe that the disclosure tends to show past, present or likely future wrongdoing. Does the Cabinet Secretary still support this definition and what action will he take to ensure that SPA's monitoring of police officers' ability to take advantage of whistleblowing procedures is robust? Captain. Well, as the Member will be well aware, these are largely matters which are operational responsibilities for Police Scotland and also uh, she will also be aware of the evidence which uh, the Member received recently in exchanges with the Chief Constable, uh, Phil Gormley, when he was before the committee and set out some of the issues that he's considering at the present moment. And also alongside uh, the Chief Constable was the Chair of the Scottish Police Authority on uh, looking at how complaints have been handled and the measures which they can take. So uh, the member is effectively asking a question of me that she has almost already asked uh, both the Chief Constable and the SPA and they have provided her uh, with an indication of the work that they have ongoing internally in the organisation in looking at these very issues. I think given the role that the SPA have in the governance of Police Scotland uh, and the way in which the new Chief Constable is looking at these matters, I think we should allow them to do that and to see how they can improve on the present arrangements at this given time. Um, I'm always uh, prepared to look at trying to address issues where we can improve areas within our justice system, including within uh, the police service. But I also do think uh, it is important that the structures which we have put in place, that members are quick to criticise when they feel they are not operating effectively, when they are undertaking work in some of these areas, we should allow them to do that and to allow them to do that in a way that allows them to look at the evidence that's been provide, provided to them to try and improve the existing system. Question two, John Pentland. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on ne negotiations to save the steel plants at DL and Clybridge. Minister Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Steel Task Force is doing everything within the power of the Scottish Government uh, and involve partners to secure a viable future for the steel plants at DL and Clybridge. Uh, discussions are ongoing, but it is not possible to comment further due to the commercial sensitivities surrounding any potential deal and further speculation at this stage, presiding officer, would not be helpful. John Pentland. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, <coughs> Minister, I, I, continue. I was planning I, to, but thank you, presiding officer. I can assure members that we are leaving no stone unturned in our efforts to achieve our primary objective of securing an alternative commercial operator for these sites and have made significant progress in the following areas. Firstly, business rates. We have legislated for a business rates relief scheme at DL and Clybridge from the 1st of April 2016 up to the 2017 revaluation and the state of the industry will be considered in the next revaluation. On energy, we are working both to reduce energy consumption at the sites and also to reduce the cost of energy. On skills, SDS have developed a £195,000 upskilling programme for key staff to safeguard the future manufacturing capability across the two locations. There are 23 participants, including a mix of process operators, tradesmen, managers and specialists each with individual and tailored training plans. Over 1,001 training days in total already completed or planned to end June. Environment, the SPA has put in place a team of specialists managed by the head of operations in the west of Scotland to ensure the best possible advice to Tata and or any new operator. And finally, procurement, we are implementing measures to address the barriers preventing UK suppliers of steel from competing effectively for public sector contracts in Scotland, including in the supply chain and the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 214 places sustainable and socially responsible purchasing at the heart of public procurement in Scotland. Minister, my apologies for interrupting you. You shouldn't have stopped for breath. John Pentland. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and I'm sure he will not be surprised to hear that I consider getting people back into their jobs as a priority. So can he assure me that absolutely everything possible has been done to ensure that the election does not delay a deal in any way, including putting in place all the government support and spending that might be necessary to achieve the rapid re-employment of personnel 
and the return of production at all the plants. Minister. Uh, well, I, I will take very seriously the presiding officer's warning about uh, breathing. Uh, um, but seriously, I, I absolutely agree that the priority for us all across this chamber is, as uh, Mr Pentland has said, it is to safeguard the jobs. That, is, uh, that has always been uh, the rationale of our primary objective to secure a potential future for the sites and to continue steel operations in Scotland. So I think it's a very perfectly fair question as to the election timetable. Well, political timetables and commercial timetables, presiding officer, just sadly very often do not coincide. But I can assure the member, as he asks, that uh, everything possible is being done to bring matters to a conclusion. I remain hopeful that uh, that can be reached, uh, but I think it would be imprudent to go into any matter of detail, frustrating though that may be for, uh, for members. But uh, I give my personal assurance that everything possible has been done and will continue to be done. Claire Adamson. Thank you, you want, I'm sorry, Mr Adam. Mr Petland, do you want in again? No, I'm quite happy with that. Thank you, <laughs> Claire Adamson. Considering uh, the Secretary might be running out of breath. <laughs> Claire Adamson. <laughs> I'll try not to run out of breath, presiding officer. Um, the minister may know that I visited BRC in Newhouse on Monday and saw the preparation of the steel um, there for the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, a significant recent contract awarded to BRC, despite a bit of scaremongering that this was going to be awarded out with Europe. Does the minister agree that we need to all get behind the steel industry in Lanarkshire? And part of that is recognising the significant efforts of this government and not referring to that as they are far, far from a token gesture, as they were described earlier. Minister. Uh, well, well, I do recognise that Claire Adamson has uh, done a power of work on these matters in relation to procurement in particular, including attending meetings in Brussels to make sure that the, the Scottish interest is not neglected. And I commend her for, for doing that and for the, the other members across the chamber who have given their time to the uh, eight meetings so, thus far of the task force. Uh, and I agree that things are beginning to look up for the whole steel sector in Scotland. And I'm pleased to see that the BRC continues to be successful, including providing steel to the Aberdeen Western Periphery routes, contrary to the implication of some uh, press speculation uh, that was drawn to my attention. The work we have done on business rates, energy, environmental skills, retention and procurement is, is uh, certainly not a, a token gesture. All our work has been in support of the main objective to retain a successful steel sector in Scotland. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. While business rates relief has been reinstated for a limited period for the two plants on the basis of them being derelict or mothballed industrial buildings, can the Minister confirm if there's any reason why, other than the EU state re relief regulations, that these two plants at DL and Clydebridge shouldn't receive enterprise status to help them be more competitive? Minister. Um, well, I think the key phrase there is other than state aid rules, because you see, I'm afraid that, that the import of state aid rules is to restrict the maximum total aid that can be granted to a certain sum over a period of two or three years. Uh, and we have discussed this, uh, Margaret Mitchell and I, and she has pursued this issue uh, persistently, as is perfectly reasonable. Uh, but you see, because the state aid rule says you cannot provide aid in excess of the figure, the import of doing so, the consequence of doing so is that you may be in breach of state aid. If you're in breach of state aid, presiding officer, then you risk infraction proceeding. If you risk infraction proceeding, then instead of the possibility of a deal being done and going through, then you end up in a, in, in a difficult situation with the EU Commission. Uh, that would not help nobody. Um, I, I think it is reasonable to say, because the points were made in the task force is not confidential, that our efforts on business rates have been appreciated. They have been appreciated by all parties. Uh, and uh, I do think that we have already demonstrated we have, uh, uh, we have exhausted or nearly exhausted the maximum relief that we can provide. And I think it is not perhaps the quantum presiding officer of the amount of relief that has been appreciated by the parties involved. It's the willingness of the Scottish Government to get our sleeves rolled up and provide every single help that we can. That is what businesses appreciate. 
not necessarily the precise amount of money which, as I say, uh, has a threshold fixed by Brussels. Many thanks. And that concludes topical questions for this day and indeed this session. And we now move on to the next